Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Harmony Barker. I am the Public Programs Manager at Holocaust Museum LA. We are the first and oldest survivor-founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. We were founded in 1961 by survivors who wanted to create a safe place to display their precious artifacts, to remember their family members and loved ones who had perished, and to educate future generations on the important lessons of the Holocaust. Today, the museum continues to provide free Holocaust education to students from across Los Angeles, the United States, and the world, fulfilling the mission of our founders to commemorate, educate, and inspire. Thank you for joining us for today's program, After Poetry and the Holocaust. After Bringing the Dead Back to Life, the forthcoming film by director Richard Crulling is a compelling and innovative documentary exploring poetry written about the Shoah. This program is presented in honor of National Poetry Month. Joining us today, today to discuss the role of poetry in a world still grappling with genocide are producer Janet Kirschheimer, poet Alicia Ostreicher, and unfortunately, uh, Dr. Michael Berenbaum is unable to join us today. He has been asked to officiate a funeral this evening. Uh, so we will, uh, but we're very lucky to have Janet and Alicia here with us today. Janet Kirschheimer is the daughter of Holocaust survivors from Germany. An award-winning poet, she is the author of How to Spot One of Us, which received endorsements from Elie Wiesel and Sir Martin Gilbert, along with other renowned poets. Her second book, co-authored by Jacqueline Pudick, Seduction, of, Seduction Out of Eden, will be published in July. She is the producer of After. Alicia Ostreicher is a poet, critic, and activist, Twice a finalist for the National Book Award, she has published numerous volumes of poetry, including Waiting for the Light, which was awarded the Beru Award from the Jewish Book Council, and The Old Woman, the Tulip, and the Dog, and The Book of Seventy, which received the Jewish National Book Award. Before we get started, please note that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the program. You can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. It is now my absolute pleasure to welcome Janet Kirschheimer and Alicia Ostreicher. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, Janet, to start us off, can you please tell us a little bit about the origins of this film? Sure. So first, I um, would very much like to thank the Holocaust Museum LA and you for hosting us this evening in honor of Poetry Month. We're really, both Alicia and I are so honored to be here with you. And I met the director, Richard Crowling, at a conference, and we talked about our mutual love of cinema and poetry, and I gave him a copy of my book. And Richard has always been interested in the intersection of cinema and lyrical language. He's an award-winning filmmaker whose work, um, fiction and nonfiction, has been screened at film festivals, museums, and networks around the world. After is the first film that showcases poetry written about the Shoah, whether from those who experienced it to their descendants or those with no direct connection yet affected by it, whether Jews or non-Jews. And after is about what it means to live in its aftermath and the responsibility of artists to respond to genocide. Both Richard and I want the film to reverberate with contemporary events in a world, as, as you said, that's still grappling with genocide, rising hate crimes and um, nationalism and war. So that is the basic um, idea of after. And why, uh, why do you think this is an important film for our, for our current moment? You sort of touched on it a little bit, but you know, kind of why now? Why this film, why now? Because I think that um, as we get further and further from the show on, there have been amazing films made by survivors and we're losing them every day. And we wanted to make something that was um, contemporary. There are contemporary poets, um, even reading the work of earlier poets. And, um, and as I said, I think, you know, we're living in a world where human life has no value. I know that um, during a filming, we asked a survivor about you, you know, the value of human life. And she said, it's the thing of least value in this world. 
And we unfortunately are still out there killing each other. And we hope our film in some way, you know, contributes and that art has that responsibility to respond to genocide. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would you like to show us the, the trailer? I think you have a-, sure. a Yep, I will just share the screen with everyone and show you the trailer. And where did my, oh, there we go. sorry for God, who had so many problems with justice, and had become disillusioned and sad. I wish you were here. That we can walk up to history and still forget it. Forget even the act of forgetting. Dein goldenes Haar Margarita. Dein aschenes Haar, Philanit. My father hangs upside down on a pipe. All of his change falls from his pockets. And rain down dark and bitter tears on her daughter of the Holocaust. I knew that she would one day do this. Everywhere, the smell of pine. Nothing is hopeless. Nothing. That is our, our trailer. And I also um, do just want to share a little bit um, from our website. And oh, this is not, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. That was my mistake. I'm so sorry. Then poetry must have in its sight. Okay. Oh. okay, I'm sorry, that was my mistake. Let me just reshare the screen. I'm sorry, I cut it off too early. Okay. We have in its sight the deepest human experiences and some of them are historical catastrophes. And we need to remember the people who came before us. It's part of the task of poetry to try and bring the dead back to life. That is the trailer and I also, this is our website and I just wanna give you a little bit of information about the poets in the film because you won't be seeing them all tonight. And I just wanna read this quote from Aharon Appelfeld, also a child survivor and phenomenal Israeli um, novelist. 
Now the time has come to forge an opening to feeling, to tumultuous emotion and to imagination and to channel them into the world of creativity. So we do have a recording of a Leonard Cohen poem and film of him as well. You're going to be seeing Alicia Ostriker this evening, uh, Christine Pareba, who is um, not Jewish, but went, her family is from Poland and she went to research her family and encountered the Holocaust during her visit. Uh, Walter Feiden, an Auschwitz survivor, who unfortunately is not with us anymore. Edward Hirsch, um, who is a MacArthur Fellowship, Guggenheim Fellowship, and a wonderful, wonderful poet. Also a very rare recording of Paul Salon, who survived um, the Holocaust and had to set out to create his own language because German was the language of those who murdered his family. Sabrina Ora Mark, who's um, an award-winning poet and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. Taylor Molly, who's one of the most well-known poets in the slam poetry world. And um, also Cornelius Eady, Pulitzer Prize nominee. He reads a poem that was found in the Warsaw Ghetto, part of the Ringel Bloom archives. And Geza Rorig, uh, who was in Son of Saul, and we'll talk about him a little more, and that's me, and a poem by Yehuda Amichai, perhaps one of Israel's most famous poets. So I just wanted to show you that, and also our um, board of advisors. We have a um, film critic, who was the film critic for The New Yorker, and author Molly Haskell, Rabbi Irving Yitz Greenberg, Chair Chairman Emeritus of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, Dr. Eva Fogelman, who is a psychologist, works with survivors and descendants, James Lapine, stage and film director, Sarah Marshall Kernochin, who's a film director, Grace Shulman, a multi award winning poet, Michael Berenbaum, who you, many of you know about, and Mary Stuart Hammond, also a multi award-winning poet. Okay, so thank you. I will stop the share. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Great. Um, thank you for, for sharing that, Janet. And I think now we'll, um, we'll see your poem um, in the film. Uh, is there anything you want to say about it before we go to that clip, or would you like to talk about it once we've seen it? I'll talk about it after, thank you. Okay, great. How I knew and when. Age eight. My father hangs upside down on a pipe that was part of a fence that separated our street from the next. All of his change falls from his pockets, 
He looks so young. Age 15. There were 104 girls in the Israelitish Machis Waste House Orphanage in Amsterdam. Four survived, my mother says. Four survived. I remember you, Frau Frank. I remember you, Frau Frank. The headmistress. She made us drink cod liver oil each morning. She said it was healthy for us. Age 21. My mother tells me Tanta Amalia told her that on the Queen Elizabeth to America in 1947, after she and Uncle David were released from an internment camp on the Isle of Man, she was so hungry she ate 12 rolls each day at breakfast. She said it was the best time she ever had. Age 24, my father tells me Otto Rice got out of Germany in 1941. He took a train to Moscow, the Trans-Siberian Railroad to Vladivostok, a boat to Shanghai, a boat to Yokohama, a boat to San Francisco, and a bus to Philadelphia, his wife and three sons staying behind. Age 31. My mother's cousin refuses to accept money that a rich woman left him. He says the money has too much blood on it. My mother tells me that in 1939, her cousin had asked this woman to sign affidavits for his wife and two daughters. She said no. Age 33. A waiter in a Jerusalem hotel tells my father he should come to live in Israel because it's home. My father tells him home is anywhere they let you in. 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 You can stop it. So Janet, uh, how did you come to write that poem? I, I came to write the poem because I was thinking about the stories that survivors tell, how they come out in small pieces at expected moments, at unexpected moments. They sometimes will tell you more details, sometimes details are left out, and I learned there are questions that I could ask and questions that I couldn't ask, and that there were things that belonged to my parents, and, and I didn't want, you know, I didn't need to know about them. My father had told me at some point that he, he didn't need to tell me everything, that it belonged to him and not to me. And he meant that in the best way he wanted to, to shield me. And my father um, was sent to Dachau when he was 16 years old. And as in the poem, um, my mother's parents got her out of Germany to this Jewish girl's orphanage. And what struck me a lot in the film is that Alicia said, poetry is what poets do with trauma. And for me, that's exactly what writing about the Shoah was. I had all this trauma, emotional trauma passed down. There have been reports about physical trauma being passed down through the genes. And, and I paid attention when my parents spoke and I asked a lot of questions and I wanted to know their stories and I wanted to know about food and where they went to school and, and things like that. And so in my poetry, I, I try to deal with the Holocaust knowing that I'm going to be a rat in a maze and I'm never going to get out and they're not going to be any easy answers and poetry is not going to, you know, to give me closure, as they say, on all of this. But poetry is how I try to figure out the world and my place in it. It's, it's just 
who I am. Yeah, and I do think that your poem captures uh, something that's a pretty common experience among um, children of survivors that they're, uh, it's very rare to uh, encounter a family where the parents sat the kids down and told them their story from beginning to end. That's really not how uh, two Gs learn what happened to their parents. It's it's doled out in these small doses over time until you as the child are old enough to start asking the questions yourself. Right. Um, and, I, and I think your I, poem really kind of captures yeah. that, that piecemeal cobbling together of, of the narrative. Yes. Thank you. And so we have uh, another poem um, to, uh, that's in the film, uh, which is Auschwitz by Geza Rorig. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about this one? Sure. Um, Giza was the star of the award-winning Academy, excuse me, Academy Award-winning film, Son of Saul, about the Sonderkommando in Auschwitz. And uh, Giza is also a poet. Yeah. And, oh, sorry. And, um, and so this poem is called Auschwitz. He um, rented an apartment near Auschwitz in December of 1986 without really knowing why and spent time there. He would go to the camp every day and explore. And, um, and then I'll tell you a little bit more after we see his, his clip. This one is called Oshvianchin, which is the Polish name of Auschwitz. Meredek szakadék felé kúszom hason. Miért muszáj látni, ha úgy se láthatom? Miért muszáj látni a héját valaminek? A köröm körmé. Nincs benne ideg. Miért muszáj látni a cement padlón, amint a gázban megszűl az az asszony? Miért muszáj látni annyi apró szentet? Széttaposva mielőtt megszülettek. Miért muszáj látni, hallani, miért muszáj? Már senki nem üvölt. Az összes test csak egy száj. Látni kell a téglalok túcsáka ahol annó a barakkok álltak, a német csoportot a rabkendőben. Azt mondják neve, és azt is, hogy igen. Okay, so I, I did see in the chat about some of the gray bars. It's a strange thing that happens in Zoom when you share sometimes. It's not there on the film, so I do apologize for that. But um, Geza's poem is, is about, um, he is thinking about women who must have given birth in the camps, in the gas chambers, and what it meant for these women and for tourists who come in now to see the gas chambers. And um, so that is what he was thinking about. Um, Geza is off filming. He um, is currently starring in uh, Terrence Malick's upcoming film called The Way of the Wind as Jesus. And um, so he couldn't be with us. But um, the what he talked about is, he didn't have any agenda. He just knew that he had to go to Auschwitz and he would find out the reason while he was there. And if there was a reason, fine. If not, was fine. He just felt he needed to be there. And um, he also didn't set out to write any poems. And the poems came after spending that month um, there. So that is where 
he has been, you know, with, with this film. Alicia, is there anything that you'd like to add about my poem or Gaze's poem? I think it's important to say that there is no one correct way to write about something as complex as the Holocaust. And that the fact that your poem, Janet, is a bit by bit accounting of how over a span of years you were introduced to the subject and what it meant in the deep life of your family. And that is a poem that captures for many people um, who are children or grandchildren of survivors, how it comes to them. Um, Gase's poem takes a completely different path, equally valid, equally moving of being there among the, the mud and puddles that remain of Auschwitz and attempting now in time present to possibly understand what it means to him, how he is to relate to it. And I think there are, there are thousands and thousands of Holocaust poems and that's because when there is um, a collective trauma, something happens to poetry. Something happens in the world of poetry when there is a collective trauma. The, the poems begin erupting out of people people who are poets as their vocation and people who have never written a poem before in their lives. We saw this at the time of 9-11, thousands and thousands of, of poems being written and shared everywhere. And I think it is so important to recognize the kind of intimacy, the kind of innerness that is translated into language in each and every one of these poems because no two are the same just as no two of us human beings are the same. The Holocaust is an event that comes to everyone differently, means something different to everyone, but to everyone who finds themselves writing about it, it is of tremendous, tremendous significance. And that's what we see in all the poetry, the deep, significance, the questions, the feeling, the pain, and sometimes the healing. Yes, I, I, I think you're right. I know when I would start a poem, I, I just cried my way through. And then afterwards, when I went back and I reread it, I read it as a poet. And I knew now, okay, now I need to shape it. And it let that part of that healing let me take those traumatic moments and to try to shape it into something that I, you know, could share with some share with some someone else. I know that, you know, it's always said there's no poem without the reader. 
And my goal was to honor my parents and they lost 90, they both lost 90% of their families. And I wanted to just honor that and, and to honor what I thought perhaps might be of use to other children of survivors, to just try to put it into words and, and to try to come up with some sort of meaning when there isn't any, and that perhaps poetry can help us to try to understand something that's just so inscrutable. Thank you both for your uh, your insight on that. Um, Alicia, I think next we have uh, your poem from from the film. Is there anything you'd like to say before we before we view that clip? Oh, yes, I would. Um, this is this is a poem that takes a completely different angle. It was written, although I have written numerous poems from very different angles about the Shoah. Um, this one took the took the books I had been reading about uh, people who saved Jews, who protected Jews during the war um, at the peril of their own lives. I was interested in this because I see myself as a coward. And I wondered where they got that courage. I think that's a, that's a very important question. One of the things we say about the Holocaust is never again, but we know it's again and again. We are not, we are not free. And every, every time it happens, there are people who look the other way and there are people who cannot help themselves and intervene and save lives at the peril of their own life. And I was fascinated by that. And the poem comes from wanting to know through reading biographies and then through writing, how, how, how did they get the courage? Um, the, there, are, there are three men who are featured in this poem. Um, and one is Raoul Wallenberg, who is famous um, as an example of the mystery of courage. He was a Swedish architect and diplomat stationed in Budapest. He saved thousands of Jews from deportation in 1944. He was only there for six months. And what he did was write false passports. And also um, he, he hid individuals in buildings that legally belonged to the Swedish government. That was fascinating to me. Then there's Oskar Schindler, who everybody knows about because of the movie Schindler's List. And he, he was a, a German industrialist. He was a Nazi party member. He worked for the party. He, he worked for the war during the war on the German side. And then he found himself um, running a factory in Krakow and hiring Jews to work there and protecting them and spending his whole huge income bribing German officers who knew what he was doing. He was keeping his workers in his factory from being deported and sent to death camps. He knew he was doing that. Everyone knew he was doing it and he got away with it. He spent his entire fortune on bribes and on, and on getting um, black market supplies for his workers. The third man I was reading a biography of 
um, was Andre Trukmi. He is less known. He was a, a, a Huguenot, a, a Protestant pastor in France, who because he was a pacifist and anti-Nazi was kind of a, a nuisance to his superiors. So they sent him off to, um, to a parish in the south of France, very remote, where he couldn't bother anybody. And there he set up, um, he set up a refugee town where everyone in the town and in the surrounding farms were in on protecting the Jews who came through, getting some of them out to Switzerland, hiding them, writing false passports for them. Um, and he did that explicitly as a Christian with a Christian message. Um, but how he got the courage, that's the question of the poem, so. We just heard that we had that quote there um, that it's the task of poetry to bring the dead back to life. Uh, but in contrast, there's a, also a fairly well-known uh, statement by the German philosopher Theodore Adorno that to write poetry after the Holocaust is barbaric. Uh, how would you respond to the, the tension between those two uh, ideas of, of poetry's purpose? Um, Theodore Adorno's dictum to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. Um, it's easy to understand why he said that and why many, many people agree with him. The sense that there is something so horrible that you can't bear it, that you can't deal with it, that it's, some, that it's somehow wrong to, to, uh, to go on at all after this. You just, you just want to stop everything. Um, it's very easy to understand that impulse. I think, that it is an impulse that anyone learning about the Holocaust can have. But I also think in a very deep way, I disagree with it. I think it's wrong. And I can, I can try to tell you why I believe exactly the opposite. I believe after the Holocaust, poetry is essential. Poetry is necessary because um, if you look at that statement, poetry after the Holocaust is, you know, um, abominable or whatever, you could say, Eating your breakfast after the Holocaust is barbaric. Tying a child's shoelaces after the Holocaust is barbaric. Going on with life is barbaric because it's too painful. But what that really amounts to is a kind of death wish and it is a surrender. It's saying, okay, I quit. It's a surrender to the brutality and evil of the Holocaust. I think that's I think that's wrong. I think what we need is poetry. Um, partly, partly because um, poetry and all the arts are so important for human civilization. Um, know thyself is a Greek maxim. Um, 
the arts give us a way to know ourselves. Poetry gives us a way to know ourselves. It, it puts us at enough of a distance to see who we are, what we are, who we have been, what we might be. Um, poetry can do all those things. Um, I like, I like to think, um, I just heard this um, from um, Joyce Carol Oates yesterday on a, 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 a talk she was giving where she said, literature is essential to society as dreams are essential to life. I like that. I think it's true. Um, and she said, poems are thought experiments. I like that. I think it's true. And I also think if, if, we, if we want to, if we believe never again, we need, we need poetry to strengthen us, to strengthen our sense both of pain and of beauty. Um, as a Jew, I keep going back to what God says in Deuteronomy um, that I think is essential. In Deuteronomy, God says, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30 in the Bible, God says, see, I have given you life, I have given you death. I have given you blessing, I have given you cursing. Therefore, choose life. And that seems to me so simple and so uncontrovertible. Therefore, choose life. If there's death, therefore choose life. If there's cruelty, therefore choose life. Um, and that is what poetry is always doing, choosing life. I think um, you make some really great points that I know, uh, I think Janet might also have some thoughts uh, about the kind of general topic of why, why poetry specifically, but art in general matters in the face of violence and atrocity. Why, why a, you know, historic event like, like the Holocaust, why poetry and art about it are important or after it are important. Yes, and, and that's, that's really why we called the film After. Um, and Richard and I took seriously Adorno's quote because we know, we all know that culture can be used for barbarism. We do know that. But to us and especially to, to me as a poet, I think poetry is an act of faith. As Alicia talked about choosing life, it's an act of faith. It's an act of defiance in the face of death. And I think rather than, you know, concentrating on the barbaric aspect, it can be holy, it can be used for good. And I think we also know in the film and, and in our lives, there are no easy answers for the Shoah. And poetry, you know, tries as, as you talked about the sort of um, thought experiment that we're trying to, to understand something and poetry is the way to get at something that almost can, that really can't be understood um, in a very, very large sense. And so I think that those things for me are incredibly important and that it's our job, um, as Edward Hurst says, to give, to try and give life to the dead, to bring them back to, to bring them back to life, to give them voice. The, those voices that were taken away of 6 million people. And so that's what we're trying to do. I mean, I never got to meet 90% of my family. 
And so that was my goal in, in my poetry to, to show them they're still here and I'm here knowing about them. So that's really what I wanted to, to try to do with, the, with my poetry and, and what we're trying to do in the film. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think something from the from the perspective of a museum professional where a, a big part of our mission, it's right there in our mission statement is to is to commemorate, educate and inspire. But kind of underlying that is it's all moving towards a path of um, Alicia, I think you mentioned this never again. Right. If we're if we're trotting along that path art, both the creative process for those who are making it, as well as the process of experiencing it for those who are on the receiving end, helps us process and, and understand and empathize with events like this, with other people. And that those are all really important steps along that path to never again. You can't commit to never again if you don't if you haven't processed what happened, if you don't understand it, if you don't empathize with the people that it happened to, then we're never gonna get there. And it's why atrocities and genocide continue to happen in, in our world is because we're not, we're not there yet. We're always working towards it. And art is a big part of helping human beings process difficult subject matter of all kinds. So that's kind of where museums, I think, come in. It's important for museums to, to not just preserve, you know, recording the, and teaching the, the facts and the history, but also to do our part to highlight art of all types that grapples with these things that can be so hard to comprehend. Right. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that, um, Harmony. And maybe another way of, of saying what you just said is that um, there is, there is a, a sickness and we cannot hope to heal the, the sickness of human violence, of human brutality, of human hatred, without diagnosing it. We need, we cannot have healing without diagnosis of the sickness. And um, objective, objective history and journalism and the facts and the figures don't get at what the sickness is in the human soul that enables genocide to happen. We need poetry, we need the arts. We need, we need all the arts because they put people into connection with their own souls in a way that often people resist because it's too troublesome. But what art does is give people access to what is deepest within them and what they're afraid of, what they're afraid will make them feel too much and make it pleasurable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we might have some questions from the audience. So uh, we might take a few minutes here at the end to, uh, uh, to take questions from the audience. Uh, so if you would like to ask a question, you can go ahead and type it into the chat or into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, and as we uh, wait for some of those questions to roll in, I'll just... Uh, ask both of you uh, for any final thoughts you might have uh, you want to share with the audience on this film and uh, and your involvement in it and uh, and why it's so important. Yes, um, I did just want to start someone had asked about being in touch and for anybody 
who wants to contact um, me about the film or Alicia, you can send an email to info at after.film, or you can go to the website and send us a note. You can certainly do that. So I think in closing, I, I really wanna thank everybody for being here and for seeing what we're trying to do for, for poetry to give that human face. We, you know, we believe that facts and figures and, and all of the historical work that's been done by scholars is immensely, immensely important. You know, but we're giving a different face, a human side, the human cost of this and how that's transmitted down. It didn't just stop in 1945. And so we want to, to show that to people. And, and as Alicia said, how the arts can, can help us to be, I'm one of those crazy poets who thinks that poetry can, you know, help us be better human beings. And I think the arts can do that. I have one more quote. Um, uh, and this is from Shostakovich, uh, who lived through the Stalin years and used Yevtushenko's poem about Baba Yar uh, in which um, Baba Yar was a place where the Jews of Kiev were massacred. Um, nobody talked about it until Yevtushenko wrote the poem and then Shostakovich composed the 13th symphony, a symphony of empathy for the massacred Jews of Kiev. And that brings us right up to date. Shostakovich says in his memoir about this, about the importance of poetry, he says, art destroys silence. What people are afraid of talking about, what people are afraid of thinking, what people are afraid of saying, art destroys silence. I think that's a very powerful, um, very powerful quote. And I think it's inspired some questions from our audience um, here. We have uh, someone who's uh, asking whether um, you have any thoughts on what's, what's happening in, in Ukraine um, and, and how the, you know, how the arts or poetry might respond to it. Alicia, if you want to take that, go ahead. Well, um, I think it's terrifically inspiring that the president of Ukraine began his career as a comedian. Um, the arts of comedy are life-loving arts. And his courage right now. I can't, I can't help but, but connect his courage staying in Kiev, giving inspiration just by, just by being there and speaking every day and knowing his life is at risk, um, I can't help but see that um, in connection with him as an artist, as a performing artist, um, who, who knew how to, how to use the resources of his spirit. And I think I've seen on social media where there are musicians playing, dancers, I'm sure there are poets writing. Um, it, it's something that people do and they need to write down their thoughts. And I think, you know, we're, we're seeing artists all over the world um, coming together to, um, you know, around this war 
this conflict, however it's being stated. And I think that the arts have broken through. There, I, I saw this beautiful performance in a subway um, station. So that human need to express oneself um, and to, as Alicia said, to try to understand oneself, to feel something still comes through even in the, in historical catastrophe. Yeah, I think that's um, very powerful. And I think it, it um, just goes to show like the, the true power of, of an artist that um, President Zelensky has been just not only such an incredible leader to his own people, but has really sort of uh, attracted the, the admiration of the world through his, through his leadership. You know, it's, I think there's, um, you're, I think you're definitely onto something uh, that there's something about his, his, that magnetism that probably comes from a, you know, from the spirit as an artist. Um, well, I want to thank you both so much for um, what's really been just a, a really inspirational and um, and and moving conversation. Um, and I think we we have a lot of interest now in in the film. So I think I'll ask one last question, which is Janet: When can people see the film, and where can they see it, and how can they see it? Right. So we are finishing up the film. And for anybody who wishes, you can get on our mailing list on our website, www.after.film. And we are hoping for a fall release. So we'll, we'll keep you posted. So thank you everyone. Truly, this has been an honor for us and to partner with you, Harmony, in the museum and with Alicia. And we thank everyone for coming. Thank you, Harmony. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for coming, everybody out there. And um, Harmony, maybe you want to say again how how where people can write to and get our contact information. Yep. I, I can tell you that it's info at after.film. So please be in touch. We'd love to hear from you. And yes, we and and we will send um, tomorrow, everyone who registered for this program will receive an email from Holocaust Museum LA, uh, which will include both the uh, YouTube link to the recording of this program, which we will post on the museum's uh, YouTube page. And we'll also share some additional resources with you um, as well. So that will, will include uh, the contact information for the film, the film website. Uh, so we will, I will be emailing uh, every single one of you um, uh, some resources uh, about the film. Uh, so on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA, I just want to say thank you again to, to Janet and to Alicia for sharing your time and your insights and your art with us today. Uh, before we sign off, I just want to invite everyone uh, to join us virtually on Thursdays at 11 a.m. for our weekly Holocaust Survivor Talks here on Zoom. Tomorrow we will hear from survivor Harry Davids. You can also join us next week on April 14th at 2 p.m. for a virtual discussion featuring art historian Alyssa Shapiro and Maya Benton, curator of our special exhibition, Ruth Gruber, photojournalist, and they will discuss the relationship between photography and social change. You can find more information about our virtual events on our website at holocaustmuseumla.org. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to see this and other recordings of Holocaust Museum LA's public programs. We bring you programs like today's at no charge. So if you're enjoying our programs, please consider supporting our work by becoming a member. To learn more about our membership levels and benefits, you can visit holocaustmuseumla.org slash membership. Thank you again to Janet and Alicia and to all of you for joining us here today. Uh, take care, and we hope to see you join us again sometime soon. Good night. Thank you.